Jordan, hey. how's it going? Oh, not good. Just great, yeah. We're yeah. having a great time over here. Just what a fucking week. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's been, when you talk about gun violence in America, uh, it has been an extremely fucking grim last two weeks now, because now there's been multiple uh, really horrific mass shootings. Uh, of course, the, the shooting in Buffalo... Uh, 10 days ago, and then yesterday, obviously, the, the mass shooting in Robb Elementary School uh, in Texas. A really kind of incomprehensible horror. And, like, there's not, not really much more you can say about it. Although it, we did have, I think, a really great discussion with our guest this week, Steve Slodkowski of the band Pup. It's extremely grim subject matter, obviously, but... Uh, uh, it's cathartic. Steve is a really great guest. I was happy we were able to have him on. Um, and I think people are going to enjoy the conversation. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and it's, we, we kind of, you know, bookended it with some light sports talk at the beginning. And then we get into some of Canada's more uh, f- funny, I guess, but kind of sad, uh, rising political stars. Uh, mostly the history sad. Yeah. Of the, uh, yeah, mostly sad. But in the history of the... Uh, the name Montreal Canadiens, the hockey team. So it's not it's not all bad. It's just mostly bad. Yeah, I think that's pretty standard. I think that's the kind of <laughs> yeah. standard vibe that our that's audience has here. come to expect. <laughs> yeah, this is the, this is what we deliver to people week in week out. Yeah, let's get into it. All right, let's do that. Um, once again, Steve Sladkowski, really great guest, uh, and an awesome band, Pup, Pup the band. Great, great band. Really great to have him on the show. Let's get to Steve. He's going to be joining the show right after this. And now we're joined by Steve Slatkowski of Pup. You might know him as the rock and roller you've seen on your television screen if you watch Seth Meyers religiously every night, which I know uh, Rob does. Rob's a big Seth Meyers head. Steve, thank you for joining That's us. That's right, yes. Uh, you're, you're welcome. Uh, How was yeah, that? You guys it, just played on Seth Meyers. Yeah, it was it was fun. I, I, I mentioned to you, uh, Jordan, when I when I saw you, um, it was it, M- NBC sent a nurse to get us all PCR'd. It was very efficient. It was remarkable. Um, uh, yeah. And Rob, you know, I know you love, uh, broadcast television, so I'm sure you saw every, Absolutely. every moment of us, uh, performing there. <laughs> Always tuning into that. Yeah. No, uh, I mean, to be honest, I don't, I don't often catch those late night shows, but it is very cool to see you, um, getting invited to play on that level of, on that stage. I mean, that's really cool. That's so sick. Um, yeah. Steve, like I was saying to Jordan last week, uh, we talked, uh, you know, last year sometime about possibly getting you onto the, the, old now defunct podcast now retired podcast r.i.p for tonight's parahel happy that we could arrange this and get you on the on this pod this is really cool to have yeah i mean uh, you, you i will say as as a, a fan you guys uh the podcast was helping me get through uh, some of the worst parts of the pandemic with the the weird mix of humor and uh utter <laughs> utter fucking grim shit that was going on That's our yeah, yeah so yeah. it's nice uh, yeah. it's nice to be here hanging out of course, of course. Today, today's a good day for that. Yeah. yeah, it's a light week, so we're glad you're here. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, exactly. Just keep it, keep it fun. Uh, Steve, are you a gamer? Oh, um, no, I'm not. But um, okay. uh, mm. but I have sold my IP uh, to video games. Uh, so if you play NHL, uh, there's pup music right. in there. Um, but okay. that's the closest I come. I uh, I'm more of a I'm, I'm more of a uh, sports watch like the soap opera of the NBA. That's kind of like video games for me. Sure. I think it is. It is. Yeah. Um, but well, no, I just I'm saw, not. Yeah. Go ahead. 
I ju- I think I just saw a pup t- t- tweet or Instagram post that you guys are in rock band as well. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We had had some NHL stuff in the past, and and the rock band thing I just think just came out, um, which is uh, is funny. I kind of I think I tweeted about this ages ago, but um, I I'm hor- horrendous at that um, at that game. <laughs> and like I've when I was that's in, like hard to do for people who actually play guitar. Yeah, it's it's very because confusing. Think about it so um, differently. Totally. And like, uh, you know, I had friends like when I was in school, um, that was obviously like a very popular, I'm in my thirties and it was, uh, right around the time when that game was, was quite popular. Um, initially anyway. Um, and, mm-hmm. uh, I, 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 I had friends who would just roast me mercilessly, uh, being like, Hey, music major. Like I thought you were a guitar guy. How come you can't play a uh, g- guitar hero or whatever um and and <laughs> but the you know the jokes on them because now my music is in there so <laughs> i still can't play it but i can play it a little bit better live <laughs> nice nice yeah but you get the last laugh exactly you could have been t- spending all that time you've spent you know creating a, a band that's gotten to this level you could have been spending that time learning how to do the expert through the fire and flames yeah it's true mm-hmm. i maybe i would have had a different relationship with uh with journeys don't stop believing you know yeah uh, but who knows that's you know we're we've, we're long past that <laughs> uh that game did, did was like kind of formative for me in finding new music um that's how i first learned of black dahlia murder was oh crazy through, uh, uh what a horrible night to have a curse from uh uh what was it nocturnal uh was on one of those games and i just loved it i loved playing it and then i just became a huge black dahlia fan because yeah. of because of that game it strikes me that like the way in which you can kind of um engage with video games now in terms of like there being internet um like capability um makes a lot of sense for a game like guitar hero like a rock band where like new music is always coming out so it's it's very quick for them to be able to get new music kind of developed for the gameplay platform like that that i think is actually pretty cool where there's almost sort of like an itunes uh element to it you can go and like buy a single in a way or like engage with new music and 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 integrate it into into the platform which which seems actually pretty cool i love it yeah it just the downside uh, of the new games is they changed at least for one of them uh as of a few years ago which is the last time i played they changed the controller and it's not five or six inline buttons now it's three stacked on top of three wow which is just i that's too complex yeah for me. you can I'm do sorry. like little you can do like power chords yeah. On yeah. there you go <laughs> so i what you're saying is i should be better at it you should you should quit the yeah. band yeah. and revisit it is oh, what i'm saying God. yeah <laughs> stay in one place all the time <laughs> yep. threaten me with a yep. good time will you <laughs> yeah <laughs> That's why everyone comes to the show for this kind of career advice. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah. this is the Sigma That's grind set. This is how we this is how we make our impact on people, exactly. on people's lives. So you mentioned you you're a sports watcher and you I enjoy am. the drama of sports. And God, this is like one of the best times of the year for sports because we have the Stanley Cup playoffs and the NBA playoffs happening at the same time. At the it's same just great. time, it and, is. And a week, a week, or, no, two weeks ago, we had like seven game sevens in one weekend. Mm-hmm. which was just unbelievable. It was so fun. And that was the weekend the Rangers beat Pittsburgh uh, in overtime to go into the next round. Now they face Carolina. But have you been what who have you been following who's your teams in uh, in each sport? Uh, um obviously as a as a born and raised Torontonian, um uh the Leafs were were uh, huge. Oh. I'm not a huge Leafs guy. Um I was going to say I'm so sorry. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> it was it was definitely more uh difficult for um for Stefan, uh, the lead singer of pup, um, you know, game seven was the night of our first Toronto show. And so it was like quite literally we delayed going on stage until the game was over. Um, <laughs> which I think speaks so to have great vibes too. Great yeah. Vibes yeah. We around. just came out and we were like, Oh, Toronto's full of losers, but like our tickets were cheaper. So I guess that's a win. <laughs> like, um, yeah. Uh, but you know, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really a Leafs guy either. I never really, I, I'm not just not really into hockey that much, but I find like the, the consistent failures of the Maple Leafs is even giving me like secondhand sports embarrassment. I don't, I don't even follow it. I don't even watch it, but just the pain, yeah. the pain of the Leafs fans every year. It's at this point, I'm just like, can someone just let these guys at this point, get one, please yeah. just let these like, guys get through one. I'm one just year. like, do it for my dad. Come on guys. Like, 
<laughs> like you know uh but no obviously and rob you know you and i have talked a lot about the raptors but uh but yeah the raptors are are kind of my uh uh of of the yeah. uh big scary maple leaf sports and entertainment uh conglomerate um they are my uh drug of choice um yes very much same um and that was fun i think i think you know um a- anytime you get to annoy sixers fans is really great um sorry to anyone from philadelphia who's listening but uh they should be familiar with my sixer slander by this point uh <laughs> This this Toronto Raptors season was a nice like low expectations year. Yeah, you know it was nice to just like just the fact that they got into the playoffs was just kind of a win in and of itself. I wasn't really expecting them. I was kind of hoping they would beat Philly, but I wasn't really expecting them to. Just the fact that they could take a few games off them, I felt good, and I didn't feel that that sharp pain of like the disappointment of not advancing further than what they're supposed to. It was nice to have that kind of low low stakes this year yeah and you know what like i think if gary trent and scotty barnes were actually healthy for an entire series we might still just be like that much more obnoxious because it could have easily uh been a raptors win uh, you know and they would have gotten rolled probably by the heat but they would have gotten to face kyle lowry there was a storyline there that i kind of wanted speaking of soap operas um of sports but like yeah you know it's 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 been fun to kind of just have um have that but it it does still kind of remind me rob of your like your hyper normalization tweet uh about when the nba came back in the bubble i still that i feel like now that's in the back of my head uh just uh, forever given how uh cool and normal the world is i think that was the b- really bizarre thing about the beginning of the pandemic and when there was no sports all of a sudden there was no real live tv and everything kind of ground to a halt yeah and you had the George Floyd protests starting, and there was no real distractions from that. And everyone was able to kind of just focus on these, like, very serious political and economic uh, forces kind of converging, all these big changes that were happening. And as the as the bubble started back up again, and I found myself being really drawn to it, and, and all of a sudden I was like, oh, thank God, this feeling of sports is back, and you can kind of turn your brain off and enjoy it but at the same time it felt like sinister in a way it felt like this is like something kind of weird and fucked up that's happening that i'm i'm allowing myself to stop paying attention to these extreme these extremely powerful uh forces that are at play right now and i'm kind of just allowing that all to just recede back into the background while i just kind of kick back and watch my professional sports in this like weirdly dystopian environment yeah where they've like piped in piped in the crowd (laughs) It's uh, it yeah, was it was weird. Weird, weird. It was weird. It, it like uh, you know, and I think as it has kind of carried on, um, and things have kind of given the this veneer of oh everything is back to normal. Like I, I just think about all these announcements that came out in professional sports that I think kind of still speak to that, where they were like, oh yeah, you know, like in the NFL, they were like, we're not gonna test anymore. It's cool. It's vibes only. It's just pure <laughs> pure vibes. Uh, yeah, and and well, it was a signal for America's upcoming national pandemic plan. So yeah. it makes sense to test it out in that environment. <laughs> exactly, first. exactly. So you know, it's it's a weird, um, it's a weird uh, uh, time to be sort of uh, someone whose whose politics I think maybe rub up against uh, the reality of of organized sport and and especially the Big Four, um, while simultaneously kind of you know allowing yourself like i do still enjoy it like i can't not you know i i I tried i tried that i tried to be uh the guy who was like no i don't need sports in my life and then you just become the insufferable person who can't talk about anything just like casually you know it it was just like uh, so i don't know i'm i'm still it's a very like kind of touch and go thing with me that it changes from day to day but um uh, I was happy about the Raptors, I guess, is what started that. <laughs> <laughs> we made it back there. Yeah, <laughs> nice, nice. We, but we saw that, you know, that distraction that that sports plays in people's lives just shattered yesterday. Did you see the video of Steve Kerr at the press conference? I'm sure you did. I did, it yes, was just, yeah. Just one of the more remarkable things I saw out of yesterday that wasn't just purely negative. And for people who are listening who didn't see it, Steve Kerr, he's the head coach of the Golden State Warriors. They are in the uh, conference finals against Dallas. And before their game, as at a press conference, he just said, like, I'm not talking about the game. I'm not talking about sports. 
you know, they're, they're, they were in Dallas and he said, just, you know, about a hundred miles from here or so at that point, 14 kids had, had died. Uh, that death toll has increased since and since he made these comments, but basically used that moment where he had all of these reporters with their cameras on him to talk about gun violence and specifically named how Republicans are standing in the way of action on gun violence. And I thought it was it was really, really powerful. And he talked about the shooting in Buffalo. And he talked about the shooting in California. And he used that moment where everyone is looking to him uh, to talk about you know, this team who's one game away from going to the NBA finals, he used that to talk about gun violence. And I thought that was really significant because not only is it just like, it's just a break from how people typically handle sports. Like they so rarely, especially front office figures and coaching figures, so rarely ever get involved in politics and talk about it. Players often do, but it's very rare for, for a coach to do it with the exception of really Steve Kerr and Popovich in, in San Antonio. And, it also just brings that conversation, specifically naming Republicans blocking common sense legislation, bringing that conversation to outlets that would never hear that and people who are trying to be distracted or just don't care or, or whatever. It's now on ESPN. It's now all over sports press. And I thought that was a really, really significant moment um, that I wish other people would use those opportunities. Uh, that's just and I just and also Rob was telling me earlier i didn't know this but steve kerr's dad was shot and killed so yeah in it, beirut it's home for him too which is unbelievable which is mm -hmm. so so sad so what did you what did you make of that well you know i think it's good i think um i think uh, you know it, it, it speaks kind of as you said jordan bringing it to different platforms i think there are times you know uh you think of um it was interesting kind of seeing how uh during the george floyd protests um Kyrie Irving kind of spoke to to what we were talking and 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 it's kind of uh it, it's been it bubbles up every once in a while in the NBA I think in ways that that the other sports leagues um are far behind um and and I think they they probably saw league wide that that the response to this line of kind of direct um sort of not conf confrontation but direct kind of um speaking to that has actually i think probably played very well for people who like basketball and and for people who who feel like they want this stuff you know it's it's the people who don't care about shut up and dribble like people who actually who want the opposite right um and i do think like we need that that is the kind of that is the kind of um uh, as as sports fans as people who kind of are not willing to sort of um recreate this sort of like cultural idea of of uh, like a macho jock um and all the kind of toxic bullshit that under undercuts and and kind of under underwrites all that like uh we we need more people like that right and 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 Kerr has a kind of legacy where where when he says that whether it's because he was an assistant coach with Popovich he played with Jordan right he played for the those Bulls teams that that won a whole bunch of championships he is the coach of Steph Curry, Golden State. Like, this guy has the kind of pedigree where when he says something, the league shuts up and listens. So I think any time that you have um, that sort of example in in a moment where um, it takes anyone and everyone who can kind of speak to how fucked up everything is, um, I think that's really important. Yeah, it was obvious why it went so viral as well because you can see the sort of that he's it's it's a really genuine moment he was extremely distressed and angry and he, like that's i think we're so used to seeing sort of politicians react very sort of like mildly to these like really horrific uh trends whether it's school shootings or whether it's mass death of covid and you see this kind of get whitewashed and 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 spun into this kind of like focus grouped uh, speech coming from politicians so it's refreshing to hear someone express that level of just anger and frustration that i think everyone in america is feeling in these moments when these these horrific incidents keep happening and there's just never any progress towards resolving it i mean it's like i understand that every single parent in america is feeling that frustration and so i thought i understand why that spoke to people i guess the issue though is that it, it, framing it as something obviously there's a number of like there's legislation that could be passed that could make it more difficult to purchase firearms especially for like these like extremely troubled young people that have 
these like really dangerous uh, intentions. You talk about background checks, closing these like gun show loopholes. There is things to to do on the legislative side to make it more difficult to purchase these like deadly weapons. It, it does seem like there's kind of something deeper going on as well, though, that it's not just a matter of background checks or these these rules and regulations that you can flip a switch on to resolve. It kind of seems like there is something much darker that's kind of like sort of rotting at this at the heart of American culture that is kind of a broader problem that can't just be resolved through this kind of legislation. Um, and I don't know what the answer to that is. I understand why people reach for these kinds of like of these answers in these moments. Definitely more needs to be done to prevent this kind of thing from happening to at least slow it down. But ultimately, it does seem like it's this very uniquely American occurrence, which just seems to be happening more and more. And, and each time the violence and the depravity is, is uh, getting turned up. And it, that, that's something that's not going to be resolved just with a bit of legislation. That's there's something there's something broader there that I think is really un- hard to understand and hard to get to the bottom of. Yeah, it's you know, we've been we've been on the road in the United States for a decade. We did our first U.S. tour kind of in or almost a decade in like 2013. Right. And I feel like at the time when we were doing that, we would like leave Minneapolis. And that was the first time where I was like really f- brought face to face with that sort of resentment and anger, you know, driving through Michelle Bachman's district and you stop for gas and there's a toque, a beanie that says no Obama 2012. And like at the time kind of like having a, being like, Oh wow, I should buy this. That's so funny. Um, and you know, just sort of realizing this has been fomenting for even longer than that. And it was only starting to come in, you know, you start to see those sorts of things that sort of come and take it. And it's printed on a t-shirt that you can buy at a pilot in North Dakota or in Arizona or, and, and, and you start to kind of like, I don't know what, how do you, how, like, what, what is, what do you do with that? It's so palpable and so direct to the point where it, it, nobody blinks that it's at a gas station. Yeah. I think that's just, it's it's interesting to get both of your perspectives because this is like as the onion has done so well over the years and sadly they've they've felt like they've needed to that every time there's a mass shooting they do a post that says how could this happen here asks country where it's the only place that happens and it's just we are a total outlier in the rest of the world in gun violence and just our culture is so deranged and bloodthirsty and the partisanship is so intense that you know we just we see things like january 6th happen and not that other countries aren't immune from political turmoil but we are just so uniquely vitriolic here and especially when it comes to guns and i just man yesterday we're recording this on wednesday and the shooting at rob elementary in texas happened yesterday it just it fucking broke me man like i drew i mean sandy hook i it was 10 years ago, so it was yeah. 24. It was still very sad, but I wasn't really... I don't think I was mature enough to really get... I knew it was bad, but like I just, I, it didn't hit me as hard as yesterday did. Maybe that's just an age thing, but God fucking damn it, dude. Just seeing like the pictures of these kids who were 10, 11, it, it, I just... I don't fucking understand. I don't get it. And it, the fact that all of these people who insulate the gun lobby and the NRA and, and stop any meaningful changes just common sense fucking changes that 90 percent of the country support stop just being a key instrument in blocking progress on those fronts tweeting out things like they're oh i'm steadfastly praying for the victims and their families like no you fucking caused this this is your fault i I, it it drives me insane well there's always the pivot to like this is a mental health Mm -hmm. issue not a guns issue but it's like well do you support other countries have mental health issues too though yeah to getting mental health care it's like no you don't you actually don't support doing anything on that level as well i mean it speaks to like steve kerr said it to get back to that press conference it's like he was like i'm tired of moments of silence and and to to put it in those terms i think is 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 part of what was so stark about it where he's like i don't give a shit about your thoughts and prayers and it's like plenty of people can shit post that on twitter but this guy has a platform uh that that uh, plenty of people who aren't on twitter will will hear you know and and then you contrast it with greg abbott today saying hey it could have been worse 
That motherfucker said that yeah, today. What the fuck? I just I don't get it. And even people re-upped it yesterday, so folks listening might have seen it. But a few years ago, Abbott complained that Texas was not the number one state for gun sales in the country, and he's like, they were yeah, number he was two. like, I'm embarrassed. Uh, or yeah, something. this is embarrassing. Yeah. We need to we need to be number one. And the the lax or even in many cases non-existent regulations on how you can buy one or the training needed or the definitely background checks. That creates a circumstance like this where you can very easily get a weapon of war on an impulse and go massacre children and just massacre anybody. I just, I I don't understand how any shooting and especially shootings like the one yesterday are not a total wake up call for everyone. Just the fact that, nope, this is it. We're not going to succumb to NRA and gun lobby influence. This is when we need to act. And just the frustration and powerlessness so many people felt yesterday was so palpable because everyone collectively knew that nothing's going to change. Like we might get a, 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 a 50-50 vote in the Senate and then we're just back to business as usual right. until the next one happens. And even later, I just saw a story from a couple hours ago. Uh, a city in North Texas, a high school went into lockdown because a kid tried to bring an AR-15 and an AK-47 into the school. And it's just like literally the yeah. next day. It just we've had more shootings than days so far this year. And this does not happen anywhere else. Yeah. And and the, to be clear, too, it's like it it's not even that it doesn't happen. Like I don't, this is this is something that I think there's there's obviously big differences between Canada and the United States. But, you know, I live in Montreal. Uh, there was a school shooting here at Dawson College in 2006. And in 1989, there was one of the most famous such incidents in the Ecole Polytechnique here in Montreal, in which several women were murdered uh, and t- deliberately targeted. Um, I think that's one difference though again i don't like I, as everyone knows i don't like to get on my high horse about canada and pretend yeah that, that we i occupy some kind of moral we can high happily take that down a peg uh, later on yeah <laughs> yeah um but you know i think that is one difference which is that you know the called uh, polytechnic for a lot of people in this country was really an event that we still remember every single mm-hmm. year and we still are we try to remember the women that were murdered and uh i think that's been something we would try to not just try to sweep it under the rug and move on yeah from. I think, too, I mean, I think about a different case, you know, Rob, another Commonwealth country, like in Australia, uh, we had uh, some time off there once. We went to Tasmania, and uh, one of the things we we didn't realize at the time how kind of grim it was going to be, and and I'm glad we did it, we went to Port Arthur. um, And there's a, you know, it was a prison colony. It is a colonial symbol. There's a lot of very, very troubling shit that went on there. Um, but also, it was the site of Australia's kind of fulcrum point for gun violence. There was a, a mass shooting there. And, and they, you know, this idea that nothing can happen. I mean, Australia is uh, the, the one example that is held up routinely. They, they, they did something about it. And it's like, it's not perfect. And I'm sure there are still issues. And, you know, I live thousands and thousands of miles and kilometers either one away. But... Uh, Direct action can be taken by politicians who have the spine to do so. That's, I think, Jordan, kind of what what you seem to be uh, striking at the heart of here. It's like, they don't give a fuck. Yeah, they don't. And then, like, the failure of the media to consistently call them out on how much money they've taken from the NRA and the gun lobby is just infuriating. Marco Rubio has taken over three million from the NRA alone in just his career, and he's just asked point blank by, you know, cable reporters like, "Well, why don't you support an AR-15 ban?" He's like, "Well, I don't think it would work." No, like just explicitly name this guy has received millions in campaign contributions from a front group that represents the interests of gun manufacturers. It's not about gun safety. It's not a membership club. That is their purpose. And failing to name that explicitly when someone tries to frame the (laughs) banning a weapon of war from the streets as being ineffective in reducing gun violence when it's proven to work is journalistic malpractice. It, it, It is so fucking infuriating that we have to kind of dance around these people who are so clear in their motives and their purpose and their intent. And it is to obfuscate and distract the Abbott thing today. And like, so Beto interrupted Abbott in his press conference. Mm -hmm. And I mean, he has definitely been prone to, you know, political theater 
I mean, it can be kind of corny at times, but like in fairness, this is this is an issue that he has been talking about for years. This isn't just something he saw an opportunity to capitalize on. This is something he's cared about for a long time. So I'll give him that. And he he walked right up to the to the table today at the press conference and called them out and called them out on their inaction and just asked like what, what what's it going to take? And they screamed at him. They called him a sick son of a bitch and asshole and said he was out of line. And it's just why is why why are the media treating it's just the the entire panel it was both texas senators it was abbott dan uh patrick all of these people who you know have the backing of the nra a plus ratings from the nra cruz and cornyn are headlining the nra and i think abbott or abbott, headlining yeah. the nra's mm-hmm. conference in texas this weekend and just like everyone's just treating them as just like, well, these are the people we have to listen to in this moment. They're going to bring peace. Like, no, they are key fucking players in, in in this catastrophe and every other disaster that occurs. Yeah. They are key figures in selling this myth that it's about mental health, that it's about, you know, just lone, bullied, mentally ill, uh, you whatever, kids or, or people acting out. No, the problem is the fucking guns. I, I'll never understand. I don't understand how this is not enough. You know what? At least the New York Times sent a push alert notification today for cooking uh, that was just simply gr- <laughs> grief, grief and cooking. That was the push alert from the New York Shitty Times grief. today. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, New York Times. Uh, I, 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 yeah, yeah, I don't know. I think there's something to be said as well, because, you know, obviously when you're looking at the causes of gun violence, the the absolutely ludicrous number of guns that are just floating around the country is the central culprit, I think. This creates one of the problems with, like, you know, trying to end certain loopholes or whatever, institute background checks. Obviously, this can, this can, like, you know, slightly reduce these incidents, but still it's like because of just the sheer number of firearms that are floating around, um, it's certainly more difficult to go buy a buy an assault weapon in the Walmart parking lot than it is to just go into a gun show, but it's still not impossible. And that's that's just, like, such a staggering problem that it's really difficult to... to see a way out of i think there's also something to be said about you know when we when we discuss like why this seems to be like a uniquely american phenomenon i think another thing to look at as well is just the violence that america puts out into the world as well and it's just this whole you know the the violent imperialism uh, internationally you've got the the you know armed death squads basically roaming the country able to with with full carte blanche to just assassinate people in the street at any time this kind of fetishization of violence is so much just baked into to American culture. Um, you know, the idea of dead kids, like, the, well, there's, there's not only is there dead kids in Texas because of the result of the shooting, you know, there's dead kids in Afghanistan and Iraq and Vietnam and Korea and all these other places Jakarta. where America has this kind of legacy. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And again, it's not... It's not the only answer. You look at Canada again. That's that's Canada has its own its own share of violence and depravity, both domestically and abroad. And you can like you can just pay attention to the stories about the graves that are being dug up outside of residential schools in Canada to know about Canada's the way Canada has has treated uh, Indigenous kids here and it treats kids elsewhere. So it's not the only issue. And it that's that's the thing is like regardless of the fact that other countries are kind of involved in that kind of violence uh, domestically, internationally, this still does seem to only ever happen with this level of depravity in the United States. There's a strange, you know, um, again, I I have, I have kind of a, an interesting perspective on this just because I think a lot of the uh, romance that I held about the United States uh, has been um, sort of the road has sort of torn it out of me where uh, whereas the romance about Canada was probably never really there in the first place you know you just kind of have a different perspective of the place you come from as long as you're kind of reading and paying attention and trying to question things but the the first time we were in in the US on tour uh, again around the same time as as sort of I saw that that no Obama took like uh, we finished the tour in Virginia and we wanted to um, you know we were very just like kind of dumb uh, <laughs> very dumb at the time. Um, and, and we're like, let's go shoot guns. Uh, you know, I wonder if we can do that, if we can just fucking do that. Um, and we called this gun range up at, outside of Richmond and, and we thought like there was going to be some sort of big, uh, to do cause we were foreign nationals, right? Like we're like, Oh, Hey, sir. Like, do we need to bring passports? Do we need to do any of this kind of stuff? And the guy was basically just like, son, this is America. You can come shoot a gun right now. And like, Jesus. And, and we yeah. were like, that was the kind of thing where like, 
you kind of just laugh at the time because you don't really know how how to how to kind of it's that nervous laugh that in, in an awkward moment or in a moment where you just don't expect something yeah. you know and it was just like and and you know my my fiance is from the United States as well and 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 we were we were down there um uh recently and and she kind of you know was like well what how long do you think you need to wait to get a gun here you know and and I was like I don't know a a a, a week a co-. she was like no t- tomorrow you'll get it tomorrow and Jesus. and and the fact that like there are jurisdictions and that there are places where as someone um who is american passing enough that probably I could go in I can definitely go in and shoot a gun right away and it's very uh, distinctly possible that I could probably purchase a gun without much um pushback I think kind of just speaks to you know th- there's something ingrained there whether that's like constitutional originalism or all the kind of sort of buzzy shit that's been in the news for for other reasons I mean we haven't even talked about Roe v Wade stuff but like I, I just there's a there's a I just sort of a, a, a deep seated belief in that access. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not even just about the the gun violence internationally or domestically, but it's about the arms manufacturing mm-hmm. industry. And it's like America. I mean, it is basically just an, a, a weapons manufacturer, an arms dealer kind of masquerading as a country. That's kind of like how that's America's primary export is exporting uh, guns and weapons to other countries and in domestically i mean it's no different i mean it's like it's the gun the country is just the whole economy it seems like it's 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 one of the central planks of it is selling guns either internationally or or domestically and uh when that's kind of so ingrained in your culture i think it's just in with that level of violence again that's being exported elsewhere that's the kind of result that it ends up having it's uh it's it's scary and it's scary because you know uh i I mean jordan i i have i can hear it in your voice today i can hear it in the voices and in and in the in the um the language used for for the many friends who i have in the united states who i love dearly who who have stood um a lot taller and a lot stronger in the face of this than i ever have because they live there and they're faced with it in a way that that um you know rob you and i don't have it filtered uh, uh, yeah. or like it's filtered to us differently you know it's it's and it, it breaks my heart there too it's not like uh, you know and I think sometimes especially in Canada there is that smugness of like well all Americans are like this otherwise why the fuck would anything be happening but like Jordan you said too like th- statistically speaking uh, the American people are not about this the electorate the the body politic broadly is not yeah. about this but those who represent it those who are in those upper echelons don't care yeah, on so many issues, they don't represent us or the things that the vast majority of us want. I mean, Roe is another example. You mentioned that earlier. Most of the country wants to preserve the trimester framework enshrined in Roe versus Wade and the right to have an abortion, the right to exercise bodily autonomy. Most of the country wants that, but we can't have that because we have the tyranny of the minority here. And that's just what's so frustrating about all of this. Just a lot of people are really struggling with a powerlessness. I know I am, my partner is, my friends are, because it's just something you want to fix and you want to end and you want to do something about and you can't because, you know, a couple dozen totally corrupt senators and ultimately a Supreme Court, I mean, it's a vote in the Senate would be nice. You know, we've already passed these things in the House, but a vote in the Senate would be nice, probably won't make it through because we've got enough people that will kill the filibuster. But even if it did somehow, the Supreme Court could just kill it. And there's just nothing we can do. And just people and kids are going to continue to die. And I just, I obviously, I mean, we've talked about this a lot on the show and I, we all agree. It just, it's not just here. It's just, it's also what we do around the world. I mean, just the, 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 the school bus bombing, uh, with, with Lockheed Martin missiles in Yemen in 2018 yeah. that killed 40 people was some of the most horrific or footage that I've ever seen and it's just unbelievably tragic and nobody fucking cares and they especially don't care when it's elsewhere because of uh, the jingoism in our foreign policy where we reduce these people to a subhuman level even if they have nothing to do with the conflict it's just everybody there is our perceived enemy so they don't care and then here it's just they don't they don't care there's just a heartlessness that I I will never comprehend I yeah that's what else can you say 
Yeah, I, and I guess it's the frustrating part too is because I know as much as I think that there's a lot of bipartisan elements between the Republicans and Democrats where they agree on a lot of the rottenness uh, and they, uh, of America and they agree on perpetuating it, I know there are some Democrats that have some good values on this predominantly. I guess that's the kind of thing that's frustrating as well though, and this comes back when you see people like Beto O'Rourke kind of making these 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 public displays and statements you know i like to see the passion from him and i like i guess if if better work has to get up and disrupt these press conferences that's more than what a lot of other politicians are doing in america at the same time you have you know just this week the that uh henry quellar race who's a pro gun rights like pro second amendment nra backed democrat and you have House leader, Democratic leadership in both Pelosi and Clyburn making calls and rallying for this guy in order so that he can might can defeat his like progressive uh, challenger by a few hundred votes, and it's like it that becomes really tricky. I think when you're trying to when when you start trying to think about you know possible uh, electoral avenues for dealing with this level of crisis, like Jordan, you pointed out, obviously the Senate and the Supreme court is stacked against these things, but I feel like there's elements of the democratic party that aren't even going to, that aren't even willing to do the right thing. Um, and that's what I think raises a, a really pervasive feeling of like helplessness when it's like, there doesn't even seem to be a political party that can like unite behind this idea of restricting these kinds of, uh, the access, to these, these deadly weapons. And I was like, I found it fascinating today too. Even like Biden was like, Deer don't have Kevlar. Like, I found that such a fascinating thing to say where it's like, because I, I feel like often you get that sort of hunting, the gun rights thing is like hidden behind hunting. And it's like, no one's telling you you can't hunt, but you can hunt with a different gun. Like, and, and you yeah. can't even get, like, that is almost like a radical thing to hear a president say. That's the weird, that's like a weird thing to me. Well, that's the, the, I mean, that's the thing about the the vast majority of these weapons that are sold in America, handguns and assault weapons like that, is they're not designed to hunt. They're not made for hunting at all. They're made to uh, kill other human beings. Like, that's the whole, their, their express purpose. So the idea, I mean, I, I know there is a big hunting culture and a lot of people have guns for that reason. A lot of these guns that are being sold each and every day, though, are explicitly designed to, or to not be used against animals, but against other human yeah. beings. I guess it's the other kind of like gross thing that I, and again, I don't, I don't want to turn it into like a partisan Dems bad thing. I mean, it's like, I, like I said, I know there's a lot of Democrats that do have good values on this. I guess that it goes back to though, again, like what the U S government does. Like I was reminded, you know, when Biden talks about this stuff or when Obama was tweeting about this, who people look to in these moments to be the kind of enlightened kind of progressive leader, the example of what political leadership looks like. But then just think about, you know, Obama ordered, drone assassinations, even a drone assassination of a 16-year-old U.S. citizen, Abdul Rahman Anwar al Alwaki, And it's like, that's, that's the one I think when we're getting at the sign of depravity that kind of animates a lot of Americans, that's kind of part of the issue is when you have, you look to these like powerful liberal figures in these moments to provide guidance and they're, li they've got literally blood on their hands themselves. Cro crocodile um, tears are crocodile tears. Yeah. You know? Oh, I, um, I, on the hunting thing i just have zero sympathy for even justifications for you know firearm ownership for that too it's mm -hmm. just like just get another hobby i don't care um when this is when we're dealing with this kind of a problem like i i don't care if if hunters are are you know caught in the wake of regulation and yeah. reform i just don't i just don't care um until <laughs> until we could prove that people are going to because there's such because the thing is there's an overlap I and mean, there, there's definitely hunters that only have you know hunting rifles and things like that and bows and whatnot and that's all they do but there's a big overlap between people who do hunt and then also have a stockpile of weapons of war yeah and i just i just don't care if people get caught in caught in the wake of any sort of response to what is a uniquely american problem it's probably worth pointing out as well that like any serious effort at taking disarming americans or taking taking gun rights away from americans i mean a central part of that is going to have to be disarming the police as well mm -hmm. and these moments yep. also i think get tricky in the in these times because like, well you want to disarm police like well when you need more armed police so they can stop incidents like this from happening well we'll just we'll arm the teachers yeah well we yeah, can arm exactly. the teachers it'll be fine you know great yeah, yeah just wonderful <laughs> let's turn all our schools into a fucking war zone that sounds like a great 
solution. And that's the thing we haven't even talked about today, which is the fact that this school district in Texas has its own police department with five officers and an armed security guard. They engaged this shooter before this incident even took place and then apparently just let him go inside the school and stay in there for an hour while he's carrying out this mass murder and these armed police, which are there in ex- in the exact situation that these proponents of, of more increased uh, gun proliferation say is the exact situation that you need these police there for were not able to actually stop the shooting from happening and there's numerous other examples as well of mass shootings that where there were armed security guards and there were armed police and they were not able at all to uh, stop the events from happening yeah the re- proposed responses from the right just on fox news alone have been insane uh, cat uh, Abu Ghazala from media matters compiled just 50 of them in a supercut uh, I retweeted it. We could we could retweet it on the insurgents account as well. Uh, but of them, it's uh, you know obviously a lot of like arming the teachers, arming the administrators, further locking down schools, getting more security guards in schools. But Grang, of course, is in there, uh, blaming people not being willing to snitch on their classmates, uh, f- higher fences around schools, uh, th- all of them are patently absurd shift the burden onto the teachers and the administrators one of them was just you know you have to be you have to be better prepared to protect yourself i mean you're talking about elementary school kids here like oh why didn't those fourth graders just you know protect themselves better against uh someone with a weapon of war and it's never hey maybe we should take a look at how these these guns the proliferation of these weapons specifically in our country is creating this unique problem it's never that it's always to distract and, and obfuscate well and you know there are things that again as someone who is is a a um experiences this as a as a, f- uh, a canadian um uh, rebecca and fernandez retweeted something earlier today that i had not even considered um uh which was a it's a new york post article of all places but like uh, basically, the the shooter had participated in an active shooter drill, and it was conducted by the husband, who is a police officer, of one of the teachers he killed. Jesus, Jesus Christ! And that's that's another thing you're going to see a lot of like increased active shooter drills, which is so insane that that's well. And again, this is like a new like normal I, for children. I'm not trying to to you know tell uh, the stories of of uh, again my fiance, but she said today she was like, oh, what did you never do one? And I was like, uh, yeah. no, I've never no. done an active shooter drill as a child, but it no, was actually not a normal. It thing was part to to... of her yeah. Yeah. public school education. And so to, to think about how entrenched that is, that you can go to a public school in the United States. It doesn't seem to not really matter what state because she's not from Texas. And and that that is there. Yeah. That is a fact. And I of can't life. even imagine how traumatizing that is for kids to have to go through. Like it's just it's. Let alone showing them exactly how to circumvent it if yeah. they ever you know like holy fuck. Yeah. <laughs> when when I was in school, in elementary middle school, so I was in middle school when Columbine happened, and I remember that was just a jarring experience. And elementary school and middle school, we didn't have active shooter. Uh, training. It was just tornado drills because we live in the Midwest. That's okay. Nothing you can do about that. That's you gotta you gotta have tornado drills. And then when I got to high school, it was it was active shooter. And then not, didn't have it in college, even though there were <laughs> there were shootings at my college. Uh, and then at work, when I worked uh, at, at different places in D.C., we had to do active shooter trainings at our office. And it's just like this is just how we're just gonna live our lives. No one's gonna. I mean, we don't have a we don't have like a enough people in, in in power to point out how fucked that is. Just oh no, sorry, you just need to install bulletproof glass at your building and make sure the doors have reinforced locks, and you need to learn how to to throw things and hide behind desks and throw things at the shooter to get him off balance. And just uh, it's I'm just here to work, man. Yeah. I'm here for my fake email job. It's that old uh, Simpsons bit. We tried nothing and we're all out of ideas, man. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Well, should we shift to uh, the new rising star in Canadian politics? Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. You guys, tell me tell me about him. I, I shouldn't take the lead here. Uh, Are you talking about Pierre Mania? Yeah. 
in Pierre Mania. What's oh, up? Oh boy. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, Jordan. There's a man right now in Canada whose boundless charisma <laughs> is uniting uh-huh. the conservative movement and setting a fire in the conservative movement that we haven't seen in a generation. And just okay. wait till you hear this man speak. It's captivating. Uh, okay. Yeah. Unbelievable stuff. A guy who's <laughs> really definitely times. an outsider, has no, no familiarity yes. with Ottawa or any uh, mainstream conservatism yes. in Canada. This lifelong politician who started reading Milton Friedman and going to conservative <laughs> debate club groups yeah. when he was 15 fucking years old. Yeah. Believe me, this guy's got the everyman populist gene that can really speak to the the economic mm-hmm. kitchen table issues. The guy who, who has people it, around the country who, who just has not been interested in updating his glasses <laughs> for fifteen years. Ugh. Yeah, just a huge nerd. One of the biggest nerds that I think I've ever seen. Yeah, in politic in politics in Canada or elsewhere, which is saying a lot. So he's r- running for what like. Was it premier? Is he wants to be. Call your party no, he leaders? wants to be the he leader. Be, yeah, he wants to okay. become the leader of the of the conservative party to like run against Justin Trudeau mm-hmm. in the next uh, election, which may end up Got being it. a which it, it we may end up with a Pierre Polivier versus Christia Freeland election, which is literally the most painful, excruciating thing that I can even imagine. Yeah, I know she sucks. He yes. he also sucks. In fact, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's just sucking <laughs> all the way was, down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he yeah i just maybe could have phrased that better but yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's just it's 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 just grim overall right now politically in canada i mean you've got polyev mania going on you've got uh jason kenny who's kind of like the arch conservative premier of alberta he just stepped down in disgrace will probably just be replaced by someone even worse like or he's gonna like the he's gonna there. wait for this conservative leader to get sacked and be like yeah it's fine i'll run federally like yeah, Ugh. you never know. You've got in Ontario, you've got Doug Ford, oh boy. who oversaw the last two years of the absolute disastrous pandemic response in Ontario, looking like he's just going to cruise to reelection. Mm-hmm. Um, because not of a lot beer of good prices. Beer. I, I yeah. do know that about His Toronto classic politics. Buck of beer yep. An- another another uh, every man who has uh, po- yes. uh, generations of political uh, establishment uh, history that uh, conveniently uh, nobody cares to talk about. Yeah, exactly. Just like not a lot, not a lot of exciting stuff happening politically in Canada. Um, May- that's pretty much that's pretty much what we got. What like we're operating a, under a right mayonnaise now. Mayonnaise country. Yeah. We just got to abolish the whole country and just scratch the whole thing and just start over again because this is not working out. What? What about NDP? Uh, what about Jack everyone, Is it good? bums everyone out because yeah. I think everyone wants the NDP to be one thing and then the NDP is like, nah, nah, we're not that. We actually <laughs> yeah, are. Yeah. I think basically for Americans that want to understand the dynamic, you can just look at the liberals and the NDP as being basically the Democrats with the NDP being like sort of this, the, this more social Democrat progressive side and then you have the kind of centrist uh, uh, Clintonite liberals that are that basically run things. That's basically the dynamic, and it's been like I think it's been a huge failure on the part of the NDP. Like really, pretty much since the, for the last uh, five seven years, like pretty much as long as Jugmeet's been in charge of the NDP, there's been a lot of opportunity to set them apart, to present sort of a different agenda, um, to organize around you know the pandemic, the failed pandemic response from the federal government, all the crises the climate crisis and the contradictions that we're experiencing right now it's been like a number of examples uh, of things that they could have organized around and capitalized on and galvanized all the energy there is in this country for people that want to have a better outcome um and it just hasn't happened and you haven't their poll numbers haven't really changed in years um everyone kind of likes them and generally like they look at someone like jugmeet singh and say oh he's a he's a nice upstanding guy but no one really takes him seriously as someone that's going to really fight for any kind of radical political change. Um, meanwhile, you have all the, the energy is going on the right, which is getting funneled into these like anti-democratic sort of uh, uh, crypto fascist convoy movements and all the <laughs> anti-masking and anti-vax stuff. Like that's where all the energy is. And it's just everything on the other side that should be organizing around housing and climate and all these really important things that people are passionate about is just dissipating. It's just going nowhere, uh, and there's no real outlet for it. Uh, Rob, you forgot to mention freedom. I think about the yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah. There was there was a, there's a lot of freedom being talked about. Um, <laughs> yes. A thing that you know, uh, uh, famously, we don't have and never have had in Canada. 
uh, clearly it's, uh, I don't know. It's, it's, it's so wild to just kind of like, you know, it does feel like some of it is a mirror, uh, in terms of like what's going on in South of the border, but that kind of like, um, doesn't really pay attention to the fact that fucking, uh, old Gavin is from, from, from Canada, you know? And like a lot of the sort of like seedy sort of like weird fascist undercurrents, uh, not only are strong here, but fucking started here. And, yeah. and, and it's just like th- to, to try and have that conversation, um, uh, with, with some people I- I- who are largely, um, I don't know what liberal voting, even new Democrat voting. I mean, uh, I live in a writing that, uh, effectively doesn't have an alternative it is basically uh uh conservative or liberal uh and and there are a lot of places across the country where i think people sort of look at it and are like oh well that's there's a meaningful difference between that and you're like really because uh pipelines are getting paid for one way or another and if you're voting for the ndp in british columbia at a provincial level your pipeline's getting paid for so it's like it's kind of a, uh, it's just like a, a grim landscape and, uh, yeah, nothing good going on up here. Unfortunately. So P- our, our buddy Pierre just did a sit down with Jordan Peterson. Oh yes. that right? boy. I, just, I was kind of, that's where I first kind of learned of him other than Rob kind of giving me a brief overview of his, his energy and charisma. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it seems like he's following like the same path that a lot of, uh, right wing, hollow populist demagogues have taken it's kind of lean into these intellectual dark web uh, figures and their platforms to sell their new brand yeah um, did you, did either of you check out the uh which i'm sure was riveting that conversation God. oh i watched it. oh yeah. did you really I, did you really uh, yeah i watched it on the stream oh that is for everyone's, oh. for everyone's entertainment You're truly doing a public Pain. service <laughs> uh, uh, yeah uh, <laughs> Uh, exactly yeah um no, no it's I, like yeah. it, was, it was just another example of like a lot of these guys that just like they you know they they again they they position themselves as being these kind of every men um uh, they want to talk about the thing that's that's po- making uh pierre popular see is he speaks to these real issues that people are experiencing the housing <laughs> the housing crisis uh the economic issues the bread and butter issues uh-huh. and these are the things that sets him apart and then he goes down and actually explains like his, how he how he views these issues and you can tell he has no actual understanding of how these things happen in the first place how these crises get to that level in the first place he's literally a landlord by the way yeah while he's talking about housing so you know just has no no idea like how these things even happen in the first place that they, they rail against socialism while having a zero understanding of what that word even means like he started talking about how he was against socialism and the he brought up animal farm within like 30 seconds mm-hmm. like his only answer about this is to read, just read from a fucking children's book that he read at some one point um so he because he got no idea how these crises starts he's not proposing any serious Serious solutions to actually confront these things uh, but for some reason he gets he gets kind of uh, framed in the media as being someone that's speaking to these very real issues he has no fucking clue what he's talking well, about it's like no one's talking about him being a fucking dog whistling like anti-semite racist like he yeah. literally is saying the the you know the, there's that that weird like world economic form that in the last couple of days came down where he's like oh well I will ban all in in uh, involvement in, in my cabinet in the world economic form it's like dude just come out and say that you're an anti semite racist like it clearly doesn't bother him that much he I mean he worked for Stephen Harper you know who uh, yeah. uh, has spoken at the world economic forum many times it's just like peddling that same sort of like um, uh, it's it's smoke and mirrors. It was a thing that that Trump did very well, but it's a thing that the Fords have done very well, of just sort of like this sort of like just asking questions kind of shit that um you know has uh has sort of been a hallmark of of some of the kind of weird conspiracy theory right wing shit. It's like oh uh, here we go right on cue, right on cue. The core of the globalist you know financial elite. Uh, conspiracy mm-hmm. is just is just anti-Semitism. Yeah, absolutely. That's, yeah, it's, that's that's the core of that. Yeah, yeah, and he he a lot of this kind of populist momentum that he's got, he's really just got from seeing the ways that this this uh, trucker convoy protest was developing and just siding with them. And obviously, that kind of that sort of the way that conspiratorial that conspiratorial uh, notion of how the economy works, the global economy works, was a central part of that. Uh, just kind of fully embraced that movement. 
and also a big crypto guy. Oh, sure. Which is great uh-huh. timing. Great timing yeah. on that. Yeah. That's to, for all the economic issues he's going to talk about. It shows really says it all there that he's picking this moment in history to uh, really to bang that drum. It's it really is just like uh, I guess my my one my one kind of um, hope is not the right word. <laughs> my my one thought I suppose is uh, that Canada is so the Canada the Canadian conservative moment, m- movement at its core is so milk toast. That maybe they'll just be like, ah, he's not, he can't be the guy. Or like, they'll think he's the guy and it just won't play. Uh, I hope, I I hope that's it. I don't know that I even believe it. You can tell by the way I'm saying it into the microphone right now, but like, I just, <laughs> yeah. it, like, I, I, uh, it's, it is so. It's a, it's a grim future we're looking at. Yeah. It's a grim future we're looking at. He, yes. He's like. It's like all of a sudden, pa- sex pest Patrick Brown is is the guy that the media is like. Well, maybe he's the one. And you're like, wait, no, he's not. None of what are we? What is going on in this country? What are why why are all these uh, dishonest, bad white men? Uh, it, it, like I I don't know. It's shocking. Yeah. So essentially, we're setting up for a a you know, upcoming showdown between like this, this growing conspiratorial crypto fascist movement versus these very like milk toast, uh, uh, austerity obsessed neoliberals with the left really having no, no real role or function in steering any of that. Meanwhile, all these pra- these crises are getting worse, housing, climate. There just doesn't seem to be any respite from it. It is. And um, it's just... for anyone that thinks Canada is some, some a politically evolved place that's like some progressive uh, uh, bastion, I, unfortunately, I would love it to be true. Not the case. Progressives are just as frustrated here as they are in the United States. Um, and it just looks a little different and it sounds a little different, but... Uh, I yeah yeah our racism and crypto fashion is kind of disguised with this veneer of civility and politeness yeah and we tell ourselves that that makes things different but really it's the same old it's, stuff when you when you peel that away it's the Dudley do right fascism up here yeah exactly it's exactly what it is well I've got something I think we could end on but it's kind of a hard hitting question that I hope Steve you can help me understand because I asked Rob recently and he didn't have an answer for me but it is a Canada question why is Montreal's hockey team the Canadians. That just seems like the least fitting name for that team in that city. What what is going on? All right. Is it I, as as I understand it, it it has to do with um, a name for the original settler, the settlers. Isn't that not the thing that this habitant du Canada, this Canadien? Is there some sort of element of that? I think so. I think um, so. Yeah. So I suppose the short the short answer is uh, violent colonialism. Yeah, that's uh, why. Uh, okay, that makes sense. Which and is, even, even, yeah, that's that's something we can all agree on, even if we might not agree on everything. Yeah, um, and and as a, 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 the Toronto Maple Leafs, uh, tr- surely have never done that. They have never uh, done a land acknowledgement um, and 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 spoken about um, uh, indigenous graves, and then uh, quickly uh, sang the national anthem of Canada immediately afterward. That's not yes. the kind of thing that the Toronto <laughs> oh Maple God. Leafs would ever do. Well, that's the thing. We love doing that in Canada. We love the empty land acknowledgement. You do a land acknowledgement and, and acknowledge the the theft and exploitation and genocide that this country is founded on, and then you immediately proceed as business as usual. Yeah, you and keep don't doing it, baby. Any actual changes. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's that's a, how we, there, that's how we there's operate. There's a um, there's a, a a sketch comedy show uh, that did kind of exactly what Rob and I were just talking about uh, called Baroness von Sketch Show. Um, that had that sort of they did that land acknowledgement and they kind of do the whole thing and they're like so should we leave should we it's it's a great sketch yeah. just look it up um i'm not going to do it justice because <laughs> i'm not funny but like um but yeah no that is that is kind of the thing it's like it's very hollow uh uh kind of symbolism and and uh empty gestures um as far as our own kind of ongoing violent uh contribution to uh the western colonial project is concerned gotcha. that makes <laughs> Does sense that clear that go, ha- yeah, go yeah, habs was, baby yeah, go yeah. habs <laughs> <laughs> i just assumed it was just a national pride mm-hmm. thing but that makes way more sense yeah, yeah. i guess in a it's, way it is yeah yeah, and yeah it's uh you know uh, <laughs> uh we 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 pretend like the canoe is our technology 
And uh, yeah, we just uh, carry on. Well, Steve, thank you so much for taking the time to yes. talk to us today. Yeah, well, thank, thank you. Uh, uh, it's yeah, we, we're really excited to have you here. We're sorry it was on such you know bleak circumstances, but I guess that's kind of the the vibe I of the mean, show. I anyway, yes, so. it's wouldn't have been different. Yeah, I mean, week. I was gonna say. Uh, it, things it's not i mean i know we, we like to pretend that uh, everything is fine out there uh you know but uh it, it's it, Heard that once yeah it's uh it's all uh a mess uh but it's nice to at least uh find um people who are are um considerate and thoughtful and upset and haven't been um too beaten down by the reality and and who actually use the platform to kind of speak to to the reality of some of these things so i i appreciate you guys appreciate you too yeah thanks so uh, much Steve. for folks for folks listening if you have not listened to pup yet go check them out and catch them on tour they're back on tour later this year you don't want to miss it it's a great show they're great guys go go listen and check them on tour this year thank you Steve. thank you Hey, everyone. Thank you for listening to The Insurgents. If you want to subscribe to the show, you can find us on iTunes or Spotify or at Substack, theinsurgents.substack.com. You'll get the latest episodes delivered straight to your inbox as well as our newsletter. On Twitter, we are at InsurgentsPod. Tweet at us, harass Ken in our replies, and then send us your hate mail to theinsurgentspod at gmail.com. Thank you once again for listening. <laughs>